church? Amen. Aren't you glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. Won't you turn to somebody and tell them you're glad to see them today? Amen. Anybody come to worship God today? Amen. Let's worship him.
the voice of triumph today. Hallelujah. Yay. Yes. Praise God. It's good to be in the Lord's house again this morning. Can I get a witness? Yes, amen, amen, and it's so good to see and have each and every one of you with us today. God is a good God. We're a Memorial Day weekend. We've got some that are out and traveling and not with us today, but we're glad you're here. And to all of our beautiful guests, we are honored to have you. Can we give our guests a hand? God bless each of you for choosing to be a part of our Family Connect Day. We're honored to have Brother and Sister Ron Brown with us and going to be preaching for us here in just a little while. After that, we're going out to our fellowship hall. We've got hot dogs and hamburgers and just going to have a good time of fellowship this afternoon. So remember that. Don't leave. Grab something to eat while you're here. Amen. Before we go into prayer, remembering the sick and the afflicted and those that have lost loved ones and family members, we want to give honor and thanks unto every vet to everyone that has served our country and given. Amen. Can we just thank God for them right now? Give it a hand clap and a shout out to everyone. Amen, amen, and amen. We want to remember every sick and afflicted. I'm sure there are multiple needs. There were none on the prayer list, so by the uplift of a hand, let every request be known unto the Lord, and let us pray together. God, we love you, and we thank you today. We thank you again, God, for this privilege and opportunity to join together with our family, with our church, and with our friends. God, we believe your word, and we believe your promises are yea and amen. It's by your stripes that we are healed. I know that there are many, many multiple needs, Lord, among us today. To our live stream, those that are listening in, God, would you bless and supply the needs of your people. Those that have lost family members, would you comfort their hearts, uplift them, Lord, and encourage them and bless them during this hour of loss. God, those that are stricken with diseases, you're the master of the body. You have put it and placed it, Lord, as it has pleased you. Let healing come and flow forth. Bless in this house today as we worship you, as we magnify the King of kings, the Lord of lords. For God, all in all, is because of you that we're here today. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Brother Mark is coming back. Could you give the Lord one more hand clap of praise? In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Such a tremendous group of guests this morning, so we're going to take just a minute for our home folk. I want you to step out and greet our guests today. If you haven't done so already, step out and uh, introduce yourself and shake hands with somebody that's our visitor today. We want to make them feel, aren't we glad they're for all of our guests this morning? Amen. Go ahead and step out and shake some hands this morning for just a minute. It's Connect Day. Amen. <laughs> A special day, a special weekend. Amen. Amen. A tremendous day. So there's one more thing that happened on this day. Sister Bill, you throw my picture up there, please. 23 years ago today. Happy anniversary to my, my wife this morning. Look at that young couple up there. Amen. I'm so thankful for her. Amen. All right, let's worship God. Hallelujah. to hide this weary soul, this back ball. And I've tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, oh, a vagabond. Yeah. It's just when Turn me around. 
you serve a God that can change you, a God that can help you, an ever-present help in time of trouble, time of need, an ever-present. Amen. You just call on his name. Hallelujah. Amen. Aren't you glad you don't have to wait in line? Amen. God can just show up. Amen. What an amazing God. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Ghost today? Amen. So good to feel God's presence this morning, isn't it? Good to worship him. Amen. I'm thankful that we know who he is. Amen. And we can call him by name. Amen. But you know what? I'm thankful he knows who I am. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad he knows what's going on in my life and he can handle my situation and your situation all at the same time. Amen. He's not overwhelmed. God hadn't been caught off guard by everything that's going on. He knows the end from the beginning. He's the author and the finisher. He started all of it. He'll finish all of it. And you know what? Amen. We're part of his church. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's worship him. Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over it, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus.
Come on, speak the name of Jesus today. Right now, we just speak the name of Jesus throughout this congregation. Yes, no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Praise God, praise God. Amen, amen. You might be seated. So good to be here today again. I'm going to ask my ushers, if they would, to go back and receive of our tithing at this time. As we are getting ready to change this course of the service, there will be no Sunday school. Brother Brown's going to be preaching for us here in just a moment. We said we've got several that are out. Brother Brent and Brother Jonathan, just come on, brother, start receiving it. And uh, they have uh, had a uh, cancelizations on the way going out on the cruise. I had to wait, and rent a car, and drive about three and a half hours. And they finally got there and did make the boat just in time. Enjoyed the trip, coming back, another cancelization, about 11 or 12 hours they've had to sit and wait in the terminal for the next flight. And so they meant to be here this morning, but they're on their way home now. They made it into Nashville, said so be here around 12. But you know, I, I thought as I was uh, thinking along that line, you ever think about your life before Jesus, how big of a turmoil it is and how, how much of a mess it was in and you, you struggled and you tried to find Jesus in the midst of it all and, and when you finally made the ship, when, when you finally got on board and you found the blessings of God and the grace of God and the power of God and, and the goodness of God, whoo, I remember receiving the Holy Ghost and being on top of it all and blessed and man, just oh, nothing going to come my way. The next thing you knew, I had a 12-hour delay. Yeah, they happen along the way. But you know what? That's not going to stop me from reaching my destiny. I'm going to keep going on for one of these days. I'm going to see Jesus face to face. Amen, amen, and amen. Again, we love you today. Thank you for being here. And Brother and Sister Brown, I love this couple. Uh, from the very first time I come in contact with them and met them, I uh, didn't meet them personally for a few years, but when just meeting them from a distance, 
their spirit, their attitude, their love for God, their love for people. And I just admire this couple very deeply. And we're honored and blessed to have them with us today. So would you just lift a hand right where you said and ask the blessings of God to be upon Brother Brown as he comes this morning, Brother Brown, and obeys the Holy Ghost. And he's got his liberty today to preach, to minister to this congregation. Bless him in Jesus' name. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Oh, we're so thankful to be in the house of God today on this uh, Memorial Day weekend, which is important because uh, we uh, memorialize. In other words, we remember those who have gone on before. I know in this part of the world, when I pastored in Jackson, they used to have what they call decorating the graves. Do they still do that? Out here in West Tennessee, they would they would have these uh, Sundays where families would go to the graveyard and uh, they would remember. Somebody, I see you nodding your heads. Uh, and that's a good thing because this was connecting the little ones, this generation, to past generations. But then, of course, in Memorial Day, we remember those who have uh, uh, given their lives for freedom in this nation. Are you thankful for the freedom that we have? I, I didn't serve in a war. My wife's uncle, uh, several of her uncles, but uh, my dad was getting ready uh, to serve in World War II, and then the war ended. He turned 18 about the time the war ended, but she had an uncle that threw, uh, flew 38 bombing missions over Germany which are only supposed to fly 25 but uh, and survive because most of them did not survive, but uh, also uh, flew a sec into a secret mission in Norway uh, that uh, we don't even know about today. But uh, many, many of you have relatives that have uh, given their lives for the cause or been injured or served, and uh, we give honor to them today. Before I begin, I, I would like you to remember the precious people in, in Ukraine. Uh, I first went over there 32 years ago to the city of Odessa. Odessa, Ukraine is on the Black Sea. Uh, Russia and Putin is doing everything within their power to try to get that city. Um, that was a city that my grandfather was born in, in 1901 and then they emigrated to Canada. But uh, I went there first time to meet oneness believers that they'd come in contact with that were in that city. And from that meeting, I went over, I've gone over several times, uh, met precious people there that became dear friends and went and started the church in what they call Kiev now. We called it Kiev a few years ago. Uh, and I've been in, t and they, they are now building a great work there. They were in the middle, be the day before the bomb started falling, they were working on their church building. They were for the first time building the church building in the city of Kiev, which is a large, large city, at least five million people. And, uh, and then I'm in contact with the pastor in Odessa. I was there about less than three years ago. And the church is absolutely packed. It probably seats uh, maybe twice as much as this building. But now with a threat of war, can you imagine that there's a good chance and they are hearing bombs every night that your church, your home would be destroyed? And you talk about people that are in peril. And so uh, I wish you'd remember the Tomev family, particularly in Kiev, and uh, Brother Sergei and uh, their family in uh, Odessa and uh, those other cities, uh, they're in peril. And uh, I know that war is affecting us a little bit here. Uh, it may affect us a whole lot more before this thing is over. But uh, uh, we thank God for the freedom that we have and we need to stand up for it. Amen. Because it can be stolen, not from Russia, but can be stolen from within this country. And there's an active, active uh, uh, agency that is working and agencies to destroy and take away our liberties until you can't do what you're doing right now. And uh, that is before us. 
but uh, I, I do want to make those comments here on this special day. And uh, I wonder if we could just stand together. Thank you, Pastor Mayo. Well, I guess it's Bishop now. Yeah. Amen. I said, how's this, how's this work? And Bishop, he said, I haven't got used to it yet or something like that. Uh, but I want to commend this church because I work with church transitions over the years. Uh, transition is sometimes a, uh, can be a challenging thing kind of like getting a new dad. You wouldn't want to have a church changing pastors every two years. You wouldn't want to have a new dad every year or two. And uh, I am so thankful for the transition of this church with your new young pastor, Brother Brent Bale, and and, uh, that that speaks good because it can be an almost seamless transition because you know these people, you love these people, they love you. And uh, they have the work of God at heart, and you are willing and uh, desirous to support them in any way possible. And so, why don't you give yourselves a hand for what's happened here? I'm serious. Amen. Amen. And uh, as a young pastor, I'm sure he'll make a few mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but uh, when you do it with uh, good intentions and desire and, uh, and wanting to do the work of God, you just learn so you can continue to learn together. But I, everything I've seen of them has been absolutely class act A1+. Plus, and I think that's tremendous. So, do you have your Bibles today? <laughs> Everybody that's got their Bible, shout Hallelujah! Everybody that didn't say amen. amen. Oh, okay. Bring your Bibles to church. I know you've got it on your phones and everything, but I think there's just something neat about bringing a physical Bible to church. I really do. But anyway, that's just me. The book of Job, chapter 29. Job, chapter 29. All right. Beginning at verse 1, I want to read these verses, but I want to say so thankful to have my wonderful wife here today. And um, Brother Mayo told me, your pastor said, well, anything you want to do, but we do kind of emphasize family between Mother's Day and, and Father's Day. And I said, that's good. And so we'll be directing our marks, remarks in that direction, but uh, hopefully... My wife and I have learned a few things about family because uh, in August, the Lord tarries and we make it be 52 years that uh, we've been married. So we've seen a thing or two in life. We really have. Good to see brother and sister Sumler, our dear friends here. Amen. Remember when they came into the church? Brother Eddie, I remember, I said, folks, I'm going to go on, I just feel I need to go on a seven-day fast if there's anybody that wants to join me. And you did. You remember that? Amen. I don't know if anybody else did, but he did. And uh, I haven't forgotten those wonderful memories in Jackson. Job 29 and verse 1. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were as in months past as in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness. His light, I walked through darkness. As I was in the days of my youth, anybody remember those days? When the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, And look at this verse, when my children were about me. Job had gone through a lot of things when he was writing this. You know the story, losing all of his uh, cattle and crops and everything and and, uh, his health and even his own children. But he's reflecting here and he's saying, I remember the days. And one of them was when my children were about me. So I want to speak to you on this subject before the empty nest or before the nest empties. 
Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, thank you for this wonderful privilege and opportunity to be here today, to be in the house of God here in this community of Decaturville. Thank you for this church, for its testimony and its being a light to this uh, region. I pray you'll bless the word this day in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It was so beautiful to get out uh, of the car here just a few minutes ago in the front, seeing a beautiful parking lot. And what was so impressive to me was not the cars or the parking lot, which was certainly a beautiful addition you've done here, but what was impressive to me, particularly when I pulled up and then someone pulled in beside us and uh, began to unload their family. And I watched as... as uh, I looked over the parking lot with parents, with uh, kids in tow, as they used to say, uh, with uh, making sure they were, uh, you know, safe getting across the parking lot, that somebody wasn't backing up or getting into a parking place, but coming to the house of God. I'll never forget one, uh, one Sunday in, in uh, Jackson, I was looking out the window uh, as people gathered in. And we had them young and we had them old. But I'll never forget watching two or three families getting out of their minivan. Um, that was even before SUVs. But uh, gathering their children together and then walking across the parking lot into the house of God. Now, I know enough that it takes a challenge to get everybody up on Sunday morning and get them properly dressed and find their shoes and find everything and try to get a little bit of breakfast in them and uh, herd them into the car and then get into the house of God. And I thought it took effort for them to be, uh, to make all those preparations and get to this point. But what a beautiful sight as they uh, marched up the steps and into church with their families. That was a beautiful thing. Now in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible said, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth, or the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Then uh, God looked upon Adam and saw that he was alone, saw it was not good. And so he took a rib from Adam and uh, made him an help meet. And her name was Eve and he brought her to him. And that became the birth of the family because now there was a male and there was a female I'm so thankful God straightened all that out at the beginning. We don't have to redefine that. But uh, they became a family. And then, as you well know, uh, ultimately children were born and uh, procreation took place down through the ages. But before there ever was ever a tribe of people, before there ever was a nation or a state, before there ever was a school, before there ever was a church... There was that uh, entity called home and family. And uh, you see, this was God's gift to mankind, a, a home. It can be a, a humble home. It could be anything from a tent to a six-bedroom, four-bathroom, whatever, swimming pool and tennis court uh, house. But whatever it is, it's not the real estate, it's not the physical uh, qualities of, of the uh, abode, but it's what is inside that place that determines what is going to be the destiny, really, of mankind. And the home is a safeguard of civilization. Now, what can I do about Washington? I, there's not a whole lot we can do. We try, but uh, uh, we, we really can't do much about it. But uh, there is a safeguard to civilization, and that is that, uh, that institution that God began at the very beginning, and that is the home and the family. It becomes a harbor, a harbor from the storms as the ships seek shelter. It can be a fold where the sheep gather in and they are protected from the wolves that are out to destroy. It can become a fortress from which there 
can emanate forth love from the heart of an individual, truth and purity, and go out into this generation. They go out from that into the unknown elements of the world. And of course, it's a sanctuary. It's a place of safety. It's a place where faith is inculcated, many times birthed. And uh, of course, there is a place for an altar, uh, a place for prayer, and a place for teaching in that beautiful place called home. It can be a little old broken down cabin or anything you want to say. But the home becomes a church within a church. It becomes a world within a world. And it becomes a kingdom within a kingdom. And the devil is out to destroy the power of the home. It really is. So the home literally becomes a reservoir. You know, a reservoir gathers water. And then that water can be poured into something else and replete and uh, replenish lakes or whatever. But most of all, it becomes the home, a reservoir in which uh, it can pour forth what is needed into every avenue of our moral lives. And we do have that in our social life, in our political life, and more importantly, our spiritual life. All these areas are affected by this powerful institution called the home. I love to see the young people here today. I love to see the children here today. We are grieving as a nation over what happened in Uvalde, Texas. I can't, I can't even put into words, and you can't either, as we see the pictures of precious little children, eight, nine, and 10 years of age, who left home that morning, maybe with their, I don't know if they had lunch or whatever they had, but mom and or dad or someone got them ready and sent them out into this world. I've often thought in the last few days, what kind of a home did they leave? Was there a prayer over them? Uh, wh what were they influenced by? And, and, and you are feeling the same way. Where are we safe? Uh, where, where are we protected? And, uh, and, and so I see the challenges before us. See, I was born in, in uh, well, the late 40s, and so I grew up in the 50s. I know that seems like that was right up there with the founding of the United States of America, but I came a little after that. Uh, but I can remember the 1950s. I don't know if you can, some of you. Uh, you know, that's when basically dad was the breadwinner, mother was at home taking care of the family and cooking the meals and washing the clothes. And, and uh, we didn't have the fine homes that we have now. You know, sometimes we talk about having a three-bedroom home and two-bath or a three-bedroom home and a bath. That was three-bedroom home, if you're lucky, and a path. And uh, that was it. That was it. But, uh, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have two, three, four cars. Our, our, our yards look like parking lots now. But I can remember as a kid, we didn't even have a car. We went on what they called the bus or the streetcar because I was living in a city. And... Uh, and then finally, I can remember when we got the first car, and uh, we didn't go to restaurants. First of all, there weren't very many, and second, we didn't have the money to do it. We ate at home. Mom cooked good meals. And uh, that, was, that was the kind of a, an atmosphere that I grew up in. And uh, of course, uh, I remember going to my elementary school. Now, I was raised in Canada, so, uh, it was a little bit different, but uh, it was amazing. This is the way I was raised. We went to school, and first thing in the morning, we got up, and we sang the national anthem where I was raised. Then the teacher had us all repeat the Lord's Prayer in school. Then we sat down, and she read from the book of Psalms a different passage every day, public school. And then at the end of the day, as we closed, we sang God Save the Queen. That's how our school went. 
And uh, I don't know exactly what it was like here in America, but suffice it to say, all that is gone in Canada. Of course, I took out prayer out of the schools in America in 1973. Gone. Can't do that. Can't do that. And, and, and I saw the flag out there and how many people ever say the Pledge of Allegiance and have any kind of commitment to what we have. And so what I'm saying is the home is under attack because the nation has changed and you and I, and I could go into a lot of detail about how our world is changed, but I think you are well aware of the fact it, was, it isn't like it used to be. Am I right? So how can we influence that? Well, you can get elected and go to Congress and try to change laws, but how many people are going to be able to do that? And would you even be able to be elected with the leftist thinking that is on this world, this anti-God in this nation that does not want to fit God into it? We're into the abortion question, as you well know now, and uh, word of God doesn't matter. It makes no difference. This nation, we always, when I was raised in Canada, and I became an Amer married American, became an American citizen. Uh, but we always admired America because in God we trust. And America was so patriotic, more so than even Canada. They, they, they saluted the flag and they respected the flag and 4th of July and fireworks and celebrating the fact that they were a democracy and one of the, wor of the first and most powerful now in the world democracy, which is slipping rapidly, but we always looked upon that. But what can we do about it? I'm going to tell you right now, when you have your family gathered around you, Amen. Job said, when my children were about me, because there's coming a day when the nest will be empty, the kids will move out, uh, and you will lose what influence you have over them, so to speak, as, as uh, you, uh, like you didn't have uh, when they were young. Now they're older. You, don't, you can't really influence, but when they're in the home, when they're in the nest, when they're at your table, when you're kneeling beside the bed with their, their little uh, frames, you know, little bodies as they kneel beside that big bed, you've got an opportunity to influence them for righteousness. When my children were about me. That's what Job was going back and he was thinking. He was thinking. And, uh, you know, homes that place, wherever it is, that little piece of real estate or apartment or wherever it is that you might live, that becomes holy ground to a child of God, sacred ground, and we must not give in to the pressures of this society in which we are living. Parental authority. Someone once said, you know, what about the schools, you know? And, and of course, it was said, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the teachers, you know, they're kind of afraid of the principal because the principal could tell them what to do. And the principal's kind of afraid of the school board because what's the school board going to say? And uh, then the school board's afraid of the parents because what are the parents going to say? And the kids are afraid of nothing. They don't want to be disciplined in school. Hey, I can remember when there was corporal punishment in school. You got a, a slap. I'm not saying we should go back to that, but I'm just simply saying there was a day when there was authority that was respected. When you did respect the, the ministry, you respected the law enforcement. Come on. You respected the teacher. And... The home has got to be that institution where uh, godly Christian influence and experience can touch this generation because I'm going to be honest with you and you know it to be true, especially if you go out and you try to bring people to church from unchurched homes, they're spiritually dark. 
prayer has not been lifted up in those homes and, and uh, righteousness and godliness and doing that which is right in the sight of God. You see, a, whole, a house is built by human hands, but, but a home is built by human hearts. And so mom and dad... As we, we kind of remember this time between Mother's Day and Father's Day, we cannot overemphasize the importance of motherhood and fatherhood and the tremendous responsibility that God has put into our hands. Amen. And so godly love must reign in the home. If there is ever a place of shelter and protection, it ought to be in the house, in the home, in the family, that bond of love. Amen. First Corinthians 13 is the chapter on, uh, you know, on love particularly. It begins with, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. A friend of mine preached one time, and his kids told me, he said, you can't believe what Dad preached on the other night. I said, what did he preach on? 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If you have not love, you're as, as uh, sounding brass or tinkling cymbal, except he didn't call that. If you don't have love, I'm become his brother Boom Boom and Sister ding -ling. In other words... Your words are empty unless there's love. And so as a parent, there's got to be that innate love within your heart for those precious children that God has put into your hands and into your care. Yes, I'm speaking to families today. Grandma and Grandpa, you can listen in. And single adults, you can listen in. And uh, parents, I want you to clue in real good because I want you to understand that God has given you a precious, precious gift uh, by bringing those children in into your home and into your family and under your care. Amen. So the power of godly love in the home can offset the pain and the influence and the rejection of God from the outside world. There's got to be strength in that home. Can you shout amen? amen. And so... Job is reflecting. I remember the days before the children went away. Job reflects. He remembers. He thinks about that. Days gone by. And they go by so quickly. Somebody said, you know what? The days drag on, but the years fly by. Oh, sometimes you say, oh, this day ever in, I'm having a rough day. And then you turn around and it's 10 years later. Somebody said sometimes be careful because your little children, when they're small, they tread on your feet. But when they're big, they can tread upon your heart. And so I want to talk to you mom and dads for just a few moments and remind you, remind you that God has given you something very, very precious. God gave you those children out of the seven plus billion people upon the face of the earth, those little ones that are in your home, two or three or one or five or whatever it might be, they are under your direct supervision. God breathed into them, yes, the breath of life, but you were the mother and father that brought them into existence, and God has given you a tremendous responsibility. He didn't give them to the state of Tennessee. He didn't give them to the school system. He didn't even give them to the church, and we thank God for that. He gave them to you. And so God's given you a wonderful privilege and opportunity. And I understand that you can train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And I know there's challenges there sometimes because, hey, I know families, parents that did everything right, couldn't have done it better, but yet uh, we understand that people have their own will and their own way. But God gave life to an immortal soul that will live forever and ever somewhere, and he's given you for a little while. Wow, while we're children, while my children 
were with me before the children went away. Is your, you need to ask yourself, is your home a happy place? Everybody say happy. Happy, happy place. Now, they run into a lot of things out there on the playground and in school and uh, with their friends and in the neighborhood. But let me tell you something. You know, and I'm thankful for, I remember one of my children told me, said, he told his wife, he said, you know what? God gave me a perfect childhood. I don't know if hers was so perfect because there was a divorce involved, but she said, God, he said, God gave me a perfect childhood. And I thought, wow, that's something to say. One, one of my sons said, God gave me a perfect childhood except for piano lessons. <laughs> he didn't like those piano lessons. But, uh, but it's a wonderful thing when you can give to your children and to your family a place that is a shelter from the storm. Every child deserves a happy childhood. Can you say amen? amen. They deserve it. And, uh, and so I challenge you that whatever you have to do, build that home. You know, there was a day when people ate together. You didn't go to restaurants and you were running here and there. And, and uh, I can remember that well. In fact, in our boys' teenage years, our niece came to live with us for a couple of years, and so they were all teenagers. And uh, apparently it wasn't done in her home, but she said, I never miss supper because we all gathered around. No matter what we did during the day, we all gathered around, and in those days we didn't. We didn't when our kids were small. Mom cooked the meals. And we ate, and she said, I don't want to miss that. I enjoy that. Probably the best thing of the day is when you gather around the table and you talk. <laughs> One mother says, hey, it's supper time. And so the kids all run out and jump in the car because they're going off to McDonald's or they're going off to wherever. There's something about sitting at the table and talking about the day. Amen. Before the children went away. Of course, what place does God have in your home? Are they going to get religious instruction at school now? Unless it's a Christian school. Are they going to get it? Are they going to get it from the government? No, they're doing everything within their power to destroy the family structure to think what's being taught in our schools or talking about wokeness. We, we didn't even know what that meant a few years ago. Everybody's woke now. And they're telling us that America wasn't founded on godly principles, that innately it is corrupt. And, uh, and so we've got, to, we've got to take it apart and uh, we've got to somehow tear America down so we can build it up with these values, and then they go along with the values. Gender distinction, 27 or 29 different gender, genders, they say. The federal government in Canada now, if I got up and preached some of this, it could put me in jail. And we're just about there in this country. But if they want to know about what's right and wrong, it needs to be in the home. It needs to be, of course, in the church, but it needs to be reinforced uh, in, the, in, in the family so that they can see godliness in mom and godliness in dad. They're not perfect, and they make mistakes. We understand all of that, but isn't it a beautiful thing to be able to come out from a home where prayer was prayed over the children before they went to do their day? They knelt before the bed at night. Uh, they didn't have to live in a home full of curses and swearing and profanity and drinking and drugs and all kinds of other things. Uh, let me tell you some. Those children aren't always going to be there, but thank God that they can come to a haven. They can come to a harbor. They can come to a shelter and a sanctuary. And then to be able to take them into the house of God. I missed a few services in my life. I, my mother spent uh, 10 days in the hospital after I was born. That's what they did back in those days. So I missed the first three or four weeks of church. But I am so thankful today that uh, <laughs> I could count on one hand probably the number of Sundays I haven't been in church in the last 73 
years. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for my heritage. I'm fourth generation Pentecost, apostolic Pentecost, and I thank God for that. Nobody, a lot of other people cannot say that. You may be first generation. You may not even be in the church yet, but you, you feel the presence of God. I challenge you, begin a beautiful legacy. My grandmother came in over 100 years ago, and uh, she won her parents to the Lord. And on my dad's side, same thing. And so my great-grandparents were, were in the church, and, uh, and I looked at my grandmother. And let me tell you something. My grandfather didn't come to church for many, many years, but uh, my grandmother did. And during the, how many remember what they used to call the dirty 30s? Uh, that was when they had a great depression in, in the country, and uh, they had gone out to farm in Saskatchewan. They were 100-plus miles from any kind of an apostolic Jesus-named church, but my grandmother would take her three children, and, and uh, actually four at that time, uh, and gather them together, and she would have a little service and a time of prayer and reading the Bible and praying over children, and uh, do you know what? Every one of them was saved, every one of them filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. And now several of us are involved in ministry and now coming on behind us a couple generations. Uh, one of those grandchildren served for 40 years in Pakistan and in India as a missionary and on and on it goes. I'll tell you where it starts. Uh, it doesn't start necessarily in a church uh, uh, or even a Sunday school teacher, although it can, but it can start in the home. Uh, when mom and dad said, as for me and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord and that doesn't protect you from all of the storms of life who knows there might have been Pentecostal children in that horrible massacre we don't know but uh, I do know one thing it's in the hands of God and so it takes a mom and a dad. And I know sometimes, like I said, my grandfather didn't, didn't come for a long time, but it takes uh, a period of time. But it takes most of all at least one parent to put that influence because that is your little flock. Pastors and bishops, they take care of flocks and uh, the needs of the church. And, and I, I love that because pastoring is in my heart. But uh, let me tell you what. You're a pastor to a very distinct congregation. That little boy, that little girl, that young lady, that young man growing up, amen. And uh, you cannot tell them what to do, but I'll tell you what you can do. You can example them what to do until they see it in your life. You know, we... For 11 years, I pastored in Knoxville, Iowa. That was a small town. I was raised in the city. My wife, my wife was raised in the country and uh, milked cows till she was 14. She said that was the greatest day of her life when her dad sold the cows. But anyway, uh, but we lived in a small town, about 7,000 people, and uh, it was very peaceful. In those days, we didn't even lock our doors. We left the keys, and leave the keys in the car in the front. Nobody would steal it. Anyway, can you imagine that? <laughs> but I'll never forget, we, we had our little family. We had three boys. And uh, our oldest one, pastor's in Fort Wayne, Indiana now, but he was riding his own bike, his own two-wheeler. So I don't know how old he was, maybe seven or eight. And so he was on his bike. And then I had my middle son, who was probably about four, and he was sitting on the, the bar of my bike. And then the youngest one was just a little guy, and my wife had one of these little kid seats on the back of her bike, and that's where he sat. And we would get in, and we would ride those bikes around town. And again, the streets were not crowded. And we had a little dog, a little black part poodle dog named Pepper, and he would run beside us and stay right with us. 
We didn't have to worry about him running off or out into the traffic. He was right beside us. And I'll never forget, Brother Mayo, I looked at that and I thought, someday I'm going to look back on this and remember what a wonderful time this was. When those three kids were trusting mom and dad, wouldn't get them lost or in an accident. And we were together, five of us and one little dog. And I thought, someday I'm going to remember this. And here we are 40-something years later, and I remember those precious times. You see, Scripture said, before the children went away, well, we can't even get together hardly because of geography now. Some live in different places, and uh, now we haven't got enough bikes to go around. But, you know, we lived in a little old parsonage next to the church, which was 100-plus years old. It had, now we, did, we had uh, at least three bedrooms in this old house and one bath. Thank God it wasn't a path. It was right between the kitchen and our bedroom. It was, it was an old place, and there was an alley that ran beside it. So it wasn't the most desirable lot in the city, I'll, you know a street in front of you, a grocery store across the street, and an alley beside you, and they had this house jammed up next to the church, about that far apart. And I, I, I am so blessed because we've lived in beautiful homes since then, and we didn't, you know, we didn't have to live in that type of a situation. Eventually, we were able to move out of that place, and the house was tore down and parking and all of that, but... I thought of those times sitting in that old drafty house. It got so cold one winter, it went down to 36 below zero in Iowa, and we couldn't get the house over 50 degrees. So we, we had, well, we, had, we didn't have to worry about carbon monoxide, you know. We had a plenty of wind blowing through there. And we had a family visiting us from Florida, and for the two or three days they were there, they were supposed to preach for us, and it got so cold, the coldest it ever got, I think. And the wife, she walked around in a coat and a scarf and a hat in the house. But you know what? That house was filled with precious memories of Christmases and birthdays and, and uh, getting ready for church and singing and laughing and playing and sometimes having to correct them, but it doesn't matter how fancy the house is or how humble it might be. It is a home, and God has given you that place to shelter your precious children. And so I'm challenging us today, and I think you are well aware of the world that we live in, the violence, divorce, all of the stress the uh, perversion, it's, in, it's on radio, television, and movies in our society, and, and, on the, and worse than that is all of the social avenues and uh, things that come on no matter what. They have access to everything at the click of a computer, and your little children, your little babies, and you need to monitor them closely, can have access to all of that. And so as they try to revise America and revise and redefine the family, God help us to build a strong home because it's the building block of society. Are you hearing me? It's the building block of society. Now, I cut this out, and I'm just going to close up here in just a moment, but I happen to read this, and I don't know exactly who wrote it, it was copied from a person by the name of uh, Geisler, but, uh, and it was on social media because uh, a minister sent it. But, and this is what she wrote, and I don't know what her religious persuasion is, but she said, I just watched a news uh, person interview a school principal and asked, what are we missing? What do children need? He went on and on about mental illness, a juvenile justice system, gun control, education reform, blah, blah, blah. He said, 
or she said, folks, none of that mumbo jumbo makes a lick of sense. Here's what children need. I like this. Children need a mother and a father who love each other and work together as a team. Children need a bicycle, neighbors, and cousins. Children need a grandma to bake with and a grandpa to take them fishing. Children need a church, a Sunday school class, and a truth-telling preacher. Children need a dinner time with home-cooked food, prayer, and conversation. Children need Sunday afternoon football and fried chicken. Children need books on tape and coloring pages. Children need summers at the lake and bazooka bubblegum. Children need a trip to Arlington and Fourth of July fireworks. Children need fire pits, s'mores, ghost stories, marshmallows, etc. Children need discipline from their parents. Children need chores. Anybody ever remember that word? A job, a way to earn what they want. Teaching them responsibility. Children need education that recognizes mama and daddy as the authority, God as the creator, and the Bible as the road map. This is not about some agenda. This is about children. Get back to basics. Family, faith, and good old-fashioned fun. Isn't that something? Home. Children, love. Now, I want to go to one last scripture, and that's found in Genesis chapter 18. And uh, verse 17, I want, to, I want to read that for just a moment. Genesis, all right, 18. And I want to read it verse 17. All right. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Now, he was getting ready to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah, which is just about where we're living right now. Hello? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, here's the verse I want you to look at. For I know him. Let's all say that together. For I know him. God knows you. He knows your ups and downs, your failures, your successes, your desire, your passion, your hunger, God, or worldliness, or whatever. I know him. And listen to this, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord. They shall keep the way of the Lord hmm, to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. You know, Pastor, you know what he was saying? I know this Sodom. I know this Abraham. I don't have any doubts. He will command his children. And we know that he would do it in a godly way. And they will learn the commandments and the things of God. You see, if I were to ask you, how many of you have trust in God? Put up your hand. How many of you trust God? That's a good question, and we can pretty well all answer in the affirmative. Yes, I trust God. I don't always understand his ways. Why does a, uh, a new Valde, Texas happen? Why do things take place? Why do children get sick and, and sometimes die in infancy or childhood and lots of other things? A lot of questions we don't have the answers to, but we trust God. But my question to you, Dad and Mom, is can God trust you? 
with those precious little ones that he gave you. In other words, I know him. I know her. I know that mom. I know that dad. They will command their children, and of course in a godly way, uh, that they're going to teach them right from wrong, purity from impurity. A relationship with God versus a relationship with sin and perversion. I trust him. I trust her. I know them. I know their heart. I know what they've purposed. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I don't want to put any of us under condemnation because most of us here, I'm sure, are doing the best we can making the right decisions as far as we can ascertain from the Bible, the Word of God, and the things that are right. We're not perfect. But I want to challenge you, Mom and Dad, today. This could be for both Mother's Day and Father's Day. The Lord could look down on them and say, well, they're not perfect because they're human beings, but I know them. I know them that I put these precious eternal souls into their care that will live for eternity somewhere, someday. But they're going to plant within those precious children the love of God, prayer, going to the house of the Lord, loving the Bible, loving one another, and doing that which is right in God's sight. They're going to do that. And so on this special memorial day, as we remember the price that was paid for our freedom in this nation and the Western world, I think, oh God, may we see a revival of the family. It's changed so much. Take time to be with your children or even grandchildren. Amen. To be able to sit around the table, not just, you know, jump in the car and let's go eat at McDonald's, but Enjoy the things of God. You're getting ready to have a picnic. God bless you. And uh, I think that's part of childhood. I remember Sunday school picnics. I remember those precious times with God's people. And I've never forgotten them. And so I challenge you, when your children are young, before the nest empties, treat them the best way that you can with the love of God and the love of family, and for grandma and grandpa to do the same. And for those that are about to be married or hope to be married, yeah, we got a rough world, but I'm going to tell you what, the power of the home can overact and be able to counteract all that's coming from our world. Jesus loves you. Let's stand together. Lift up your hands in thanksgiving to the Lord. Just take a moment to praise him on this special day. I wonder if you're here and you've still got children in the nest. And if they're in the room, if you could go and get them and just for a moment stand before God here. I, I want you to do that because there's nothing more beautiful than gathering your little ones or those teenagers and coming to stand before God as a family, a home. That's it. Amen. Look at this. Oh, this is beautiful. Amen. Thank God. These precious children, that little fellow there, he may grow up to be taller than mom or dad. But there he is. Come on. Look at this beautiful young lady. Oh, my. Beautiful. Wow. Two of them. Are they twins? Oh, double trouble. <laughs> hey, Amen. Are they, are they out of their terrible twos yet? Oh, well, it'll happen. <laughs> it will end. Hey, Amen. But isn't, isn't that beautiful? Step forward. Come on. Come forward a little bit. Don't be afraid to step. All of you. Hey, Amen. You got children here? Hey, Amen. Look at this. Isn't this wonderful? Amen. 
Hey, I like your tennis shoes. Those are nice shoes. <laughs> Amen. All right. Got any grandparents here or somebody that could just stand behind these folks and kind of lay a hand upon them? Come on. Come on. If you're, it may, they may not even be your children, but you're a grandparent or something, and you've been through this, and the nest has been emptied, but you want to just lay hands upon these precious people. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, you're beautiful and you're handsome. <laughs> Amen. Thank God. Thank God. All right, find someone that you can just lay hands on. Amen. If they're with a child here, praise the Lord. Family and churches are strongholds to help protect the family. Amen. Never should the question arise in that home, are we going to church today? And then you say, are the doors open? We need the church. How many believe that? Amen. To reinforce what mom and dad are doing. Just lay hands upon them right now and let's pray. You that are out there, stretch your hands forth to these precious people. That's it. Come on, right now, in Jesus' name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Touch these, Lord God. Touch them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Oh, God, give wisdom, Lord, and direction to these parents, oh, God. Sometimes they feel frustrations, Lord God, and fears and, and inadequacies, but, God, you are going to give them grace and strength and help, Lord, to raise these precious little ones in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, that that nest, Lord God, that nest would be a wall of protection about them, Lord, and they will feel the peace and the safety and the love of God in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh God, let the anointing of the Spirit be upon them and let this church, Lord, be a part and a participant, Lord, in helping to see these children nurtured in the ways of God, that they will be Holy Ghost filled, Lord Jesus, uh, baptized in your precious name, Lord God, and equipped to go forth into this generation with the love of God deep with within their spirit, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Uh, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, our God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've put within our hands and into our care. And God, we're trusting you in all things. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord God. You've got a wonderful church. You've got precious gray-haired people here, and you've got little two-year-old twins and, and everything in between, and you've got a well-balanced group, and this is beautiful. And, and let me say something, grandparents and parents. Sometimes we can get a little critical of kids. Why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? Or they shouldn't. Be a friend to them. Hey, they're a kid. They're a teenager. Did you not make any mistakes? Oh, don't get started on that. <laughs> Support him. Say, it's so good to see. Yeah, he may be doing, not doing things exactly like he should, but just say, it's glad to see you here. Amen. Amen. Give him a slap on the back. All right. Ladies, give these precious girls a little hug. Say, we're so glad you're here. Amen. Pastor, Bishop, amen. God bless you, Brother Brown. Very good word. A friend of mine, many of you know Brother Dale Newman and Brother Tracy. Tracy had kids of his own, and his grandkids were cutting up there in Dad's house. And Tracy said, Dad, if that had been me doing that in your house, you would have whipped me. He said, if that was my kid, I would. And well, that's your job. It's, that's your job. God has given them children to you. Again, Brother Brown, thank you. Sister Brown, God bless. So good to have you. You might be seated for a moment. Uh, don't run off. We're going to, Brother Marcus is coming in just a moment. But I saw in a clip this morning when he had his title up, The Empty Nest, uh, before the nest was empty. I, I seen a little clip this morning, a little YouTube clip where it's nest with three baby birds in it. And I seen a snake 
so the snake climbing up in the tree to the nest and began to devour those three baby birds. They were hunkered down. They were hugging that nest as tight as they could. Mom and dad wasn't there. And we're in a world today where mom and dad's not there. And what's happening to our children? That's a serpent that's out to kill and steal and to destroy. And if mom and dad, if he can get you occupied and doing your thing and going your way and involving your life and everything else but the family, he'll come in and he'll destroy the children. We need, we need strong moms and dads and grandparents. Very good word today. Very good word today. Again, thank you for being here. We're going to turn to service, Brother Marcus. We've got a few things we want to give away, an upside-down grill or a wood-burning fire pit. I guess you have to stand on your head so you can see what that is. Amen. Tremendous day today. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our family and Friends Connect service this morning. As we've already mentioned, we've got hamburgers, hot dogs already grilled, and immediately following service, we'll be going out to our fellowship hall and having a time of fellowship. To our church people at DPC, please allow our visitors and guests to go first. We want them to get, get their food and be able to sit down and find them a place to eat. And then there's 200 hamburgers, 200 hot dogs, so if you eat all that and there's nothing left, and there's chips and cookies and uh, beans and anything you want to drink out there for the most part. And uh, we want you to have a good time, get your belly full, and just enjoy fellowship. Anybody enjoy our cottage prayer this past Wednesday night? Yeah. Amen. It was a tremendous time to get to go to somebody's house and connect with our church family. I, I know we pour a lot into family month, but we just feel like it's very important yeah. to get our family stronger and to help. And anything you can do to strengthen your family, your marriage, your relationship with your kids, anything you can do. Amen. I feel like it's worth doing. It's worth putting forth effort. Amen. That being said, we're going to give away, Sister Angie's going to give away a couple of things, or three things actually. And all of this is for family. You can get together, build your fire, make you some s'mores if you like that. Then we have some games that you can play together as a family. And then we have a gift card to two or three different restaurants where you can, if you don't have time to go and make a meal and sit down and eat around the table. You can go to one of these places and, and sit around the table with your family. Amen. We are so thankful for all of our visitors here today. I am thankful for my uncle Ish. That is my dad's twin brother. Just kidding. They're not twins. They do look a lot. And my aunt Vicky and her mom and my brother Matt. I'm thankful they're here today. Okay. So we've got three drawings, and we've put all of your family names in here. And you can pick which one you want. And this is not rigged. Jennifer Black family. Come pick what you want. They want the fireplace. Okay. Billy Browder family. You want the games? All right. Y'all gonna play in the water sprinkler? <laughs> it's us, but I'll put it out. Clarence Brown family. You can come get your gift card. Take sister. Brown out to eat. Nazareth. <laughs> he eats too much. All right. Amen. Remember your one. Who's your one? Remember to connect with them this week. Uh, try to send them text and uh, try to get them to come to church, try to set up Bible studies, whatever we can to reach reach our world. Amen. One at a time. Amen. Make that connection. Remember this coming up week, we're going to celebrate us with Sean and Terry Lewis. If you have 
uh, signed up for this event coming Saturday. You have already placed your order on what you're going to eat. It's going to be a black tie event out here in the Fellowship Hall. We'll have people serving, and we're going to have a great time with Sean and Terry Lewis, and then uh, that, they'll be back with us Sunday morning and Sunday night that weekend. Also, June the 5th will be our graduation Sunday banquet for our seniors and our kindergartners immediately following our Sunday night service. And then remember, June 11th will be our transition service. We'll be having a meal following that. It'll be the transition of pastor transitioning to bishop and Brother Brent transitioning to pastor. And we're excited about what God is doing. Amen. Don't you love your church family? Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful to be a part of DPC? Praise God. Amen. Stand with me. There'll be no service tonight. Remember that. There'll be no service tonight. Amen. And we're going to close out with prayer. And we're going to ask God to bless each and every family. And we're going to ask him to bless our food. Amen. And we have servers that are supposed to be sliding out, hopefully, and they'll hopefully get you took care of. If you, have, if you do not know where our fellowship hall is, you can either go out the building, come around, and come up through there, or you can slide right out that door and go right through the doors, and somebody will help get you directed to where the food's at. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we love you. God, for your word.